Morning, everyone. Good morning. Love that. I'm not the morning person, but you help me be the morning person with that energy. Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, on this wonderful, wonderful early morning. Um, on behalf of the Greater Washington Partnership and the Greater Washington Board of Trade, I am happy to welcome you to this year's Capital Region Transportation Forum. I am delighted to see all of you and excited to hear from the transportation leaders across the region. First, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, including our host sponsor, Georgetown University, our supporting sponsors, EXP, HTR, HNTB, and Transurban, and our community sponsors, Aon and EY, and our transportation sponsor, Lyft. Thank you for making this year's forum possible, and I'd love a round of applause for the sponsors. Now, before I turn it over to the people you really wanna hear from, I do want to offer a few remarks. Um, many of you know that the Greater Washington Partnership is committed to championing the region's economic growth and vibrancy. We are an alliance of the region's leading employers from Baltimore to Richmond, we bring together business, government, and community leaders to identify and address shared opportunities and core challenges that are facing our region. So in that spirit, we appreciate you joining today's event to discuss what is needed in terms of collective action on our shared transportation priorities. Transportation is one of the pillars that supports our regional economy, and we are at a pivotal, pivotal moment for some major catalytic infrastructure investments. And we have all talked, met, convened. We know that we can seize the opportunities, recognizing that when one part of the region wins, the rest of the region wins. So let's talk a little bit about wins because I always feel it's important to start out more hopeful before we go into challenges. Um, Earlier this month, the Biden-Harris administration announced $16.4 billion of investment in passenger rail projects between DC and Boston, nearly $7 billion of which will fund Maryland projects like the construction of the Frederick Douglass Tunnel and modernization of Baltimore Penn Station. Also in Maryland, Governor Westmore has relaunched the Baltimore Red Line an east-west transit rapid pro project that will provide vital transit connections for Baltimore residents and economic development opportunities across the Baltimore region. Here in DC, our Metro's Silver Line expansion is starting to pay off. In Dulles Metro Station, which opened last November, it has served more than 1 million passengers, allowing the 60-year-old airport to become the fastest growing U.S. airport for international flights this year. And in Richmond, GRTC is moving forward with their plans to construct a north-south bus rapid transit line following the high success of the existing Pulse BRT line. Last but not least, Virginia passenger train ridership is at its highest level ever. The state recently secured $100 million in federal grant funding for passenger rail infrastructure improvements and is working toward a new Long Bridge by the year 2030. So it is a very exciting time to be talking about transportation in Maryland, DC, and Virginia. But that said, we can't gloss over our challenges and they're all equally challenging. So the order doesn't matter, Randy, in which I am stating our challenges before us. But let's start with <laughs> our region is still grappling with pandemic related shifts in commuting, office occupancy and transit ridership, which are having a real impact for fu uh, transportation funding. The Metro system is facing a $750 million operating budget deficit next year, which if unaddressed will have severe impacts on our region's largest transportation system and regional economy. With legislative sessions in Maryland and Virginia only weeks away, coalescing behind a short-term funding solution for Metro is urgent. Then to put Metro on the path to long-term st uh, stability, 
and sustainability, we will have much more work to do in the coming months, but also in the years ahead. Now, WMATA is not alone in its challenges. Maryland is projected to see a $2 billion shortfall in transportation funding over the next six years, not including funding needed for major projects like the Red Line. And the whole region faces a long-term threat as revenues from gas taxes decline, as cars become more fuel efficient, or people buy more electric vehicles. So the conversation that we have slated for today is timely, and it's important that we celebrate our region's transportation wins, but we are also navigating a very uncertain time, and that continued uncertainty caused by the pandemic and the funding challenges facing our transportation agencies create much concern. This is our sixth consecutive year that the Greater Washington Partnership and the Greater Washington Board of Trade have co-hosted this forum and brought the region's transportation leaders together. Jack, we appreciate the partnership and the shared commitment to creating a regional mobility system that drives inclusive economic growth and shared prosperity across Maryland, Washington, DC, and Virginia. Our two organizations look forward to capturing and executing on ideas that have been generated today. And with that, we will get started. We are excited to hear from many transportation leaders who are here with us. That includes Randy Clark, General Manager and CEO of WMATA, who will provide an update on the state of Metro and also leaders of the respective departments of transportation from Maryland, Virginia, and DC. But first to set the table for this conversation, our opening speaker is Dr. Cirillo, professor at the University of Maryland, Maryland Transportation Institute, who will share her research and insights on post-pandemic transportation trends. But before we get to our um, opening speaker, let me turn it over to David Green, Georgetown University's Chief Operating Officer and our host for today to say a few words. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kathy. Um, for those of you who I have met, I apologize if I ran by you in the in the coffee. Uh, they, they had me come down here quickly um, so we can say hi later. For those of you who I've not met, I am the Senior Vice President Chief Operating Officer here at Georgetown University. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Kathy and Jack for hosting this event today. Uh, it is very timely. Um, I think every one of us, if we stood up here, could give personal anecdotes, professional anecdotes, lifelong anecdotes about how timely uh, this is. Uh, you are in the Lower Fink Auditorium, which is in the Hariri building of the Georgetown McDonough School of Business. Um, here on what we endearingly call the Hilltop Campus of Georgetown, and we've been here for 235 years. Uh, one of the things you may not know, um, I've been in this city my whole life and it took me some time to figure it out, is that our law center, um, one of the largest, most prestigious law centers in the entire world, is actually located not here, but four miles away, just north of the US Capitol, just west of Union Station. Uh, and so selfishly, I've planted senior leaders from my team throughout this audience to learn what, what is gonna be said here today, because um, as we start to build out around that law center in what we're calling the Capitol Campus, moving 3000 students from our School of Continuing Studies, uh, moving executive education from our McDonough School of Business, starting a school of environment in, in our Earth Commons, and moving our McCourt School of Public Policy down there beginning next fall, uh, we'll go from a campus that has traditionally housed about 3,000 law students very quickly to a campus that has six and seven and 8,000 students. And if anyone has worked anywhere where you have two separate locations, campuses, headquarters, the first question from every person that you ask to go to the new location is, how is transportation and how is parking? Uh, and the very next question is about food and coffee and other things, but it is always about transportation. And we understand that. Uh, in our lives every day, it, it's it's so obvious how transportation impacts our ability to commute, our ability to access all of the entertainment around a city like Washington and around the region, um, and really just everything from getting to our jobs every day to getting to our kids' soccer games on the weekends, uh, or 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 home to a game at night. And so it's very relevant. There's so much. I, I love Kathy's tee up on uh, so many wins, so many things we should be proud of. Um, if you just look back 10 years, I was watching, I wasn't planning on telling this anecdote, but I'm getting excited. Um, I was, I was watching one of the spinoffs from Yellowstone. I won't give it away, but in the show 1923, 
they have some cars driving around. And one of my teenagers came in and said, that really didn't happen. There's two cars in that entire town. And my teenagers believe Star Wars is actually closer to reality than what things looked like 100 years ago and actually 100 years ago. And so if you think about the progress that we as a community, we as a nation and as a, as a world have made in transportation, it, there are also moments for us to come together and think about how can we come together, think about efficiency, think about the future, think about the environment, think about the economy, uh, think about the convenience uh, and the importance of what we have to do in our everyday lives. Um, I think the collection of talent uh, that we have in this room uh, is a great group to help solve that. And, and if there's anything I've learned about being in higher education in Washington for 22 years, the problems that we solve um, here in Washington and in the region around Washington, Richmond and Baltimore, um, the world is watching. Uh, for better or worse, the world is watching. And so uh, it's very exciting to, to be able to solve problems. Sometimes there's a lot of pressure when we create problems here because the world is watching. But you can see that really exponentially spread around the world and around the nation um, and up and down the East Coast when when we solve a problem here and there's no greater, um, you know, uh, greater task than what we have today with the future of transportation. And so uh, with that, welcome to the hill. If you don't know why it's called the hilltop, take a walk around um, after this. Uh, if you know why traffic is near and dear to my heart, drive around the campus at the moment. Um, but thank you for coming here today. Um, you've got a great agenda. You've got the right people to talk about it. Uh, and welcome to Georgetown. Thank you, Jack. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, really great turnout today. This is exciting. Uh, my name is Jack McDougall. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Washington Board of Trade. And uh, as Kathy mentioned, you know, we've been happy to co-host this with the Greater Washington Partnership now for six years. Uh, it seems that our list of priorities continues to grow. It's not shrinking. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do uh, and working together, we'll get it done. Um, transportation has been a priority for the Board of Trade going back for our entire history. In fact, uh, we were part of the original drafting of the street extension plan in 1900. And of course, as you recognize, only two cars on the street. So then it probably made sense, maybe not as much sense anymore. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do to figure out what that's going to look like. Uh, so we've got a lot to, co to cover today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cinzia Cirillo. She is a professor at the University of Maryland's Maryland Transportation Institute. Uh, this institute brings together researchers from multiple fields to tackle today's most pressing transportation challenges. And uh, Dr. Cirillo will offer some insights regarding our persistent traffic in our region. So I've been kind of curious about this myself, particularly since our offices sit half empty. So why is there so much traffic? And so hopefully she's going to help answer some of those questions for us. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Cirillo. A number of uh, questions that have the same question and problems that this audience is probably facing. Um, so um, the first the first one was um, about um, the um, the 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 policy about toll the lane. Uh, so while Virginia has a clear policy about toll lane and they've um, built them, it's not clear what, what Maryland is doing. And you know, for this kind of project, it's important to have um, decision that, uh, that, that, that that are the same decision for different regions. Uh, the second question was about the question that was just mentioned, why um, with empty office downtown and people teleworking, uh, we, are, we are experiencing traffic congestion and increased travel time with respect to the pre-pandemic. Uh, so with my researcher, we worked overnight and uh, we have data available at University of Maryland and we were able to compare travel times uh, to from 2019 and 2022. So these are trajectory data. These are data that come from the mobile phone of all of you. And we have data that covers 70% of the American population. Uh, so we calculated that travel time, especially in the afternoon, has increased 20%, and travel time has increased even more during uh, the weekends. This is stuff that we are all experiencing. Uh, so uh, the Washington Post was asking me why this happened. And um, in my opinion, this is happening because uh, people, there is a um, people substitute activity. So if you are at home working all day and you are bored, then and you are and we are a particularly rich area, what happens is that you do other activity. So you go out for dinner, you go to see friends, you go to see family, and all this, as you know, here happens by car. 
Um, and also we have seen a decline in the use of public transportation. So all this combined together um, explain why we are experiencing this uh, um, increased congestion, especially in the afternoon and during the weekends. Um, all right. So probably you are familiar with this. This is uh, the RITIS platform. This was actually started by uh, the state of Maryland and now is used by 20 states um, around uh, the US. And now it's expanding even uh, outside the US. And this is able to monitor congestion. Um, and uh, so uh, we, um, we observe and we monitor congestion real time everywhere. The, the thing is that uh, what I'm arguing here is that this is not enough because in order to make investment, we need to be able to predict uh, what are the consequences of our action or no action when we decide not to do anything. Um, you are probably familiar with this kind of model. This is the state of practice of modeling in transportation. Each MPO has one of these. Uh, so this is the classical four-step model. We have one statewide for Maryland. There is one for the district. There is one for Virginia. And uh, so each of us is working with one of these, uh, but this um, has, is kind of uh, the old generation. Um, so this is the one for Maryland. You see that this is in communication with the outside world. So here you see the district and you see all these zones. Uh, we work by zone. So you, we, 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 uh, we, we calculate how many people from a zone to another, where these people go and the mode they take and the path. And this is used for all our um, uh, uh, prediction uh, exercises. All right, so I want to show you a number of, so we are using this kind of models. So the, here the importance of maintaining this model because we are using these models to uh, decide, to make decision about investment. And as you know, investment in transportation are huge investment. And as I always see to say to my students, you don't have a plan B in the sense that you spend, if you spend the money for the wrong project, there is no money left for another project. And so you needed to be sure that what you are doing is the right thing. So this was a uh, this started uh, again uh, with an initiative of um, state aid administration, Maryland state aid administration, and you know there is a big incentive now to have complete streets. What is the concept of complete streets? Complete streets is a street where uh, car and pedestrian and bikers and user of public transportation have all space to do uh, to to take this mode of transportation, and all this is done in a safe way. Um, so you see that um, kind of the, 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 the complete streets are characterized by these indicators that is the level of traffic stress. And so this is what we feel when, you know, we are biking or walking in dangerous condition, which is, will be, will be um, um, level of stress for the worst one. And then, you know, uh, if, if, if the condition of the streets improve, your level of traffic stress decreases. I don't know if you have been in the Netherlands, but the Netherlands is a good country where every street is a complete street. And you see that level of traffic stress one for bikers is the one where uh, bikers are completely separated from the traffic. And so this is the safest possible condition. So we translated this into mathematical models. So, and these are the results visualized. Uh, and this is Baltimore. You know, This is the place where a number of investments are going to be made in the future. And so you see a level of traffic stress increasing from left to right and income uh, from low income to high income. So um, what you see here is that while there are people, some people walking and biking in the, um, in the, in Baltimore city, but you know, um, the richer you are, the less you bike or walk. And, uh, and there is an effect of the, uh, the traffic stress. In, so if you increase, if you improve the condition of the road, then more people will bike and, um, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and walk. I have another slide like this in which uh, we do this for purpose, uh, for, uh, um, more for the purpose, so why you are moving around. And there is almost nobody uh, walking or biking for work. 
Um, and there are a lot of children walking to school in very dangerous condition in Baltimore City. So this is the application of our model, the old fashioned statewide model that was, we were able to get all this information and visualize, visualize this for the decision maker. Okay, I'm now showing here the new generation of transportation model. Uh, well, we are still working on that. These are agent-based. So instead of working with zone, uh, we work with individuals. So we are simulating the choices of the individual in terms of the mobility for the entire Maryland. So 6.5 million of people. So we have uh, information about 6.5 million and we simulate all their um, the, their mobility. So here you will see just the district. So you will see uh, on the left side, these are the activities. So what people are doing along the 24 hours, starting midnight, ending midnight. And on the other side, you will see the vehicles, where the vehicles are going. Let's see if the video works. Okay, so this is night and all these people are at home you will see a red dot popping out and these are people going to work. Yellow is shopping and purple is a school. So you see that it's 5 a.m. People are starting to go to work and less people are at home. You know, a lot of work activity and school activity. It's morning. There are some shopping activities. This is downtown DC, a lot of work happening downtown. Not many people at home. This is this is a noon. And this is the afternoon where people are starting to go back home. Less people at work is 6 p.m. Lots of people at home. Shopping activities, other activities, and finally, everybody will sleep, hopefully. <laughs> All right, and this other one is the cars. Um, and the red, of course, is congestion. Well, we are still working on this. Uh, congestion can be um, improved the way we model congestion, but this is our uh, the preliminary results that we have. All right, so this is really the newest generation of models possible. There are not many implemented in the world, uh, just some um, attempt. So our effort is to uh, move this into practice and have people like you using them. Uh, so we are also working, so these models are, they are much more advanced than the first step model. And one of the first application that we are doing is the prediction of the ridership on the uh, purple line which will affect the campus. And this is the kind of analysis that you can do. So the forecast of the ridership. Preliminary analysis are on the conservative side of the ridership on the purple line, but this is to be expected because, you know, then other activity will come and more connectivity will be generated by the purple line. And so we expect that over time this will evolve. Um, I also want to conclude by saying that things like this we are implementing in other countries. Um, in particular in the Middle East, where a lot of, uh, well, now everybody's in Dubai. We are working on the uh, models, uh, the transportation model for Dubai. And, you know, the question are the same. Uh, multimodality, uh, new mode of transportation, how to incentivize people to use public transportation, how to reduce congestion, how to promote economic growth there. And we have done the same exercises for Qatar before uh, World, World Championship in 2022. And with this, I will conclude. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Carrillo. Uh, interesting. And it never ceases to amaze me how much data is out there, especially about what we do individually. Kind of scary, actually. All right, so let's talk a little bit. So uh, Metro, uh, Randy is here uh, to, to share some thoughts with us. Uh, you know, as most of you know, and Kathy mentioned earlier, Metro is facing some major financial challenges 
as are many other transit agencies across the country. You know, the Board of Trade, GWP, and our partners across the region were committed to the long-term viability of WMATA as it's one of our region's most critical assets for equitable economic growth. You know, we also support the current efforts to address the pending financial crisis, recognizing that serious, and I would say even audacious actions will be needed to finally resolve the longstanding structural issues and deficiencies that have prevented the agency from operating in an effective manner that we all deserve and expect. But I do wanna call out Randy for a minute and just say thank you, Randy, to you and your team uh, for continuing to make significant progress. You've been with us now for 16 months. Uh, it's a Herculean task, uh, but you're prioritizing riders, you're improving transparency, you're making critical service improvements, confronting safety concerns, taking action to address issues like fare evasion and public safety. And these steps and others that you've been taking are increasing ridership and improving the rider experience. I ride Metro every day and generally most all the time have a really great experience. I'm not back to where we need to be though. Uh, and so there's a lot more work that we need to be needs to be done. We have to continue to reduce costs. We have to stabilize revenues and we have to strengthen, if not totally reinvent the governance model that Metro operates under. In its current state and its current governance model, WMATA is likely not viable. We must come together as a region and solve this challenge as management can't do it on its own. Can't overstate the urgency of this. So with that, Randy, share with us some of what's going on at Metro. Hey, good uh, morning, everyone. Everyone get some coffee? All right. I got to get everyone uh, excited to talk about the good stuff, so then we'll leave it to our distinguished panel to figure out the solution. Come on, that's a good joke to start off. Um, so I want to just start off and just really thank Kathy and Jack, as usual, not just for hosting, but leadership, right? It takes a lot of effort to not only just put events like this together, but to actually lead arguably the most complicated region in the world, right? We, we are this tri-state with the federal city all together, and it's very hard to get this many people unified around a topic. And I just want to really call out uh, uh, Jack and Kathy for the leadership and, and, and really the Board of Trade and the Great Washington Partnership for all you do. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I, I want to also uh, recognize uh, with me today is our chair, Paul Smedberg, uh, who is doing a fantastic job uh, being chair of our organization. Uh, he actually won this year. I'm going to make him a little embarrassed. Uh, the National Transit Association called APTA Board Member of the Year for all of America, for all of his work. Uh, uh, and so I really appreciate uh, Paul and our other board members. You know, this isn't exactly, I, quite frankly, I'm not sure why any of them want to be on the board some days, uh, but they do a fantastic job of trying to, you know, represent the, the complex government model, governance model Jack mentioned. Um, I guess I just hit advance based on, is there a, perfect, thank you, appreciate that. Um, so uh, let's get kind of right at the, the topic at large here. So many people know, you know, it's on my screen. That's how bad it is. <laughs> I hit down. I hit. Ah, there we go. I'm good at following instructions. I've been married for a long time. Um, so this is at a glance Metro. I'm not going to go through all the details here. Obviously, a very significant system. Uh, you know, tens of billions, arguably over $100 billion of infrastructure that has been invested in this region. A couple of highlights here that I, you know, I think are worth mentioning. And, you know, thanks to our Georgetown host, I, I had the privilege of uh, uh, bus to walk here today. And maybe one of the more disconnected parts of our actual region to the transit network is Georgetown. Uh, and that was a purposeful decision someone made not to have Metro at Georgetown a long time ago. And a lot of people would like to have Metro back into Georgetown now. Interestingly enough, we need to figure out our blue, orange, silver, east-west corridor uh, problem that has been being studied for a long time. So it goes to show uh, how we are a region are never going to stop evolving. Uh, part of this, and you know, I know we're here to talk about Metro, and I'm going to get really deep into Metro, is I do think as part of our call to action, we need to think larger than Metro, though, as a region. We have an enormous amount of other transit operators and we don't necessarily run as efficient as possible being the network that we have set up. We don't really have one true transit network. We have Metro as a backbone and are a lot of other networks that kind of connect in. And I do think we have a once in a generation opportunity to think about as VRE and Mark trains are thinking about regional rail, how that actually interacts with Metro, how we think about all of our local bus operators in Metro and especially if we're all going into zero emission, how are we going to operate? 
It's not whether it's Metro on one street or someone else on another street. We need more human beings in this region on transit, regardless of the flag that that bus or train is flying. That's what we need to do as a region. And Metro, I'll tell you from our point of view, we are all in on working with any partners to get more people on transit, regardless if it's Metro or something else. But I do think we have to be thinking about that. There's cost efficiencies and, and driving the customer experience on that. The part that I think is really highlighted, especially for our business community, is it's simple. Wherever Metro goes is where the community grows, just period. And you can fly, every time you fly into DCA, you see it. The Balsam Corridor is Metro Corridor, and now you can see the Silver Line Corridor. Uh, you can go to Bethesda. Everywhere you go, there's a Metro link, and that's where the economic activity of our region. I think the part here that is the most amazing is within a half a mile, so 3% of our region's land, makes up 30% of our property tax value. Think of what would happen if Metro doesn't exist. We don't, that, that does not stay. And look at all the development that is happening. The younger workforce of our future, which until before I get this job, I thought I was in the younger workforce. This job is making me quickly. I'm not in the younger workforce. They want to live in more dense parts. They want to be less car dependent. And we need to do this from an affordability point of view. Our housing is very, very expensive. Therefore, we have to have affordable transportation for the workforce of the future. But wherever Metro goes, and this slide I think is fantastic, and it shows that there's a lot more opportunities. So I see County Executive Elbridge here. I know we're working with, with Montgomery County on North Bethesda as a good example. Uh, we're working with uh, County Executive also Brooks in Prince George's. There's parts in Virginia that we're working on. There's so many things that can continue to elevate our entire region around transit-oriented development. A couple of highlights, because I think Kathy's right. We do have a dire situation in front of us, but we should always, always try to take a moment and celebrate that we are doing good things, not just at Metro, all of us. It's a team effort. And a couple of ones I want to highlight here. So, uh, you know, we talked about uh, Silver Line. Kathy mentioned that. We opened the Silver Line in the last year. Potomac Yard Station, you know, 60 year goal to get out to Dulles Airport. And we are now delivering a lot of service out there. And especially during this holiday period, it's really going well. We've had our seventh uh, clean independent audit. So that is run by a totally not Metro management independent clean audit, which is a big deal, as you all know, in an organization to get done. We met or beat every single one of our annual safety metrics last year, every single one, period. We are running a safe system. We have 85% customer satisfaction, the highest in Metro's history of people saying that when they take the system, they think it's a good experience. I don't know about you guys. I, I'm blown away by that every day. I pinch myself. There's nothing that 85% of anyone agrees on anything, right? We can't get 85% of people to agree it's Thursday. So every day that we're doing that, we're feeling really proud internally. 70% um, reduction in fare evasion at where we put new gates. I'll talk in a second. Crime is going down. We are growing ridership in the first part of November and the last part of October. Highest amount of federal taps we've had on the system in three and a half years. So federal employees are returning to the system. Rally for Israel Day two weeks ago. We carry 565,000 people on the rail system, 950,000 for, throughout the whole system. If we don't have this system working, there are no rallies for Israel. There are no Fourth of Julys. There are no inaugurations. There's no World Pride. We can't turn it on and off like a faucet. We either have the system working or we don't, and we can't do those big events. And I want to highlight Sunday, just after Thanksgiving, was our highest DCA travel uh, uh, that we've had at Metro since 2015. When you run great service, people are using the service, and the system is in really good state of good repair because of the work. A lot of people in this room, my Ford predecessor over there, put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in it as well, uh, and board members. Um, to get this system really rebuilt. And we really have a good quality safe system right now. 2014, as I mentioned, ridership is up. Public safety, crime is down 26% since February. I will tell you that is very hard to do in a region that is battling a serious crime issue right now, but we are going at it openly, transparently, community-based, but we are not putting up with people doing bad things in our system. We have to have a safe system for our customers and our employees. I talked about ridership. Fair equity, we created a low income fair program. We already have 6,000 people signed up to that. And we, and we got our zero emission program going on the bus side, which is a big goal for all of us from a regional environmental perspective. Okay, that was the good stuff. But I also look at this as an opportunity. Where there's a challenge, you know, the old saying, there is an opportunity. 
this is the challenge. We internally, unfortunately, call this big red because there's no other way to talk about it. This is the current operating deficit. This was, came out in June. We've done some work since then, and I'll talk about that here. But the, the one highlight I want to really mention, there's a couple things here. The yellow represents the federal relief. Without our congressional delegation in the last administrations, we would not be where we are, period. And, and all of you that run governments around the area wouldn't be there either, right? Federal relief got us all through. Uh, that is coming to an end at Metro, just coming to an end. You'll see the pandemic uh, impact to our operating structure, and then you'll see historic inflation. And luckily, we all see inflation coming down, and it's coming down very rapidly, so it's pretty transitory. But the pandemic hit our revenue big time, and it hit our cost of actually delivering the business. The yellow dashed line represents, if someone says out there, if you only collected every fare and everyone came back to the system, that's the white line. So we want every rider back. Trust me, I want a million people back on this system tomorrow, and we're growing every single day, and we're working at it. But this is not a profit enterprise. This is a public service ultimately, and we are going to try to get as many people back and recover every fare as possible, but there will always be that delta and COVID really made a big delta there. So the value of Metro's funding has eroded over time. Again, people did fantastic work in 2018, um, but the capital funding was not indexed. So one day it was going to eventually come to this. Unfortunately, with historic inflation, uh, and capital prices have gone up. You know, uh, if you, I don't know, you're building a deck at home, all of a sudden the deck in 2018 is five times more expensive today. We now have to just come to reality that the capital funding that we had on the, on the right side is not what it was. The value of what you could buy for 500 million is not what it is today. Pre of funding also, again, great that we get federal funding from our federal government partners, not what it is today. If both of those were indexed to CPIW, we would actually have enough capital money to get us through, I think it's 2037. So certainly no worry about capital and we'd have that predictability to do better procurements, better cost planning, everything like that. On the left side represents, we also gave a credit to the jurisdiction and I'm certainly in no position to say whether that was right or wrong. I bet you it was the right decision during the, during the time. Start of COVID, it was chaos, very much uncertain, but that credit did mathematically happen so we are at 1290 is where our current base subsidy is it, on the subsidy. If, if we grew it at CPIW would be at 1486. And if we had no credit and grew the, the, the subsidy at CPIW, we'd be at 1592. So again, a decision was made in 18 to do a 3% cap. Again, whether that was right or wrong is kind of a different right now in 2023, but, but during the pandemic, no rules of 3% uh, followed, right? We were in a totally different economic time. So we all have to agree what we are really trying to contain growth long term and what is the right economic measure to do that. As I mentioned, there's three factors that really led to today's deficit. The credit, about $196 million is what Metro gave a credit to the jurisdictions. I will point out compounding of that credit because it also meant the next year there was a 0% increase on the base. If you put the four year or five years together, it actually equals about $690 million of lost base uh, and compounding to uh, to Metro. We obviously have the inflation part and that actually hit collective bargaining premiums very significantly. Uh, the union had a COLA increase as part of their contract. So they got compensated and whether right, rightly or wrongly, I, I mean, they signed a contract and they're doing hard work and it was a pandemic. So they got paid for the work they're doing. Uh, but that, that obviously hit us pretty hard. And then the decrease revenue, which is ridership. We basically had no riders for a couple of years and now we got to recover that. And you put all three together, it's a significant amount of money. Want to highlight two slides in a row. One is where we are an operating budget annual growth in the last five years as a region. And then I'll show you of our large transit operators. And I say this because, listen, Metro, we own a fiduciary responsibility. I pay taxes too. I want this place to be as cost efficient as humanly possible. But we also have to be honest that Metro has to be held to the same standard as everyone else in the region and the world, right? Metro uh, you know, can't be like the pandemic and inflation hit us differently than everyone else. So as you'll see across the board here, these are all of our regional partners. We are clearly in the middle towards the lower end of five-year operating growth. Does that mean we don't have work to do? Of course not. I think we still have work to do. And I think we've shown that, and I'll talk in a second, that we found even more expense to take out of, out of the system. And I think there might be a little bit more as well. But I think, you know, we got to be honest of where Metro was in the last five years. If you look at our transit, our large transit peers, we're basically right in the middle here as well. And the dotted line represents 
we'd, if we didn't open the silver line in Potomac Guard Station, we'd be actually towards the lower end of operational uh, of growth. So I actually believe if you look at those fairly, we are, we are managing the place correctly. And that's just the economics of that we all have to deal with. So mention the deficit here. One of the challenges we have is if we start using the capital program to actually fund part of the operating program, which is allowable in this kind of nuanced uh, Federal Transit Administration way. And I think, you know, I think we have to reality. I see that being part of the solution here for a year or two, even though we might not want to do that as an agency. Uh, that pulls in the use of the capital program because we're really using the debt capacity because we still have to get the preventive maintenance work done. So right now, we will have our capital program be a little bit, I don't want to call it insolvent, but it's more our debt capacity will expire in 2029. If we use a full transfer, we will then pull that into 2028. And now hopefully with the next round of bonds, we will get lower interest rates, which will help manage this a little bit better, cash flow, a lot of that stuff. But you know, the old saying, stealing from Peter to pay Paul, which is probably a good appropriate analogy at Georgetown University. Um, we got to be real care we got to be real careful of how we do that. And this organization worked really hard to not use capital for operating, which was the historic and got us into a problem. We need to be real thoughtful about what we're doing around that topic. These are the things that put us in uh, at risk if we do that capital program transfer. You know, we, we need to continue to buy our new trains. Reliability, we're building a new factory. Our Hitachi's building a new factory in Maryland, delivering these trains, our zero emission program. Our signaling system is becoming very antiquated, very old. It's gonna become the largest reliability problem we have in the whole system. It's almost there right now. And our blue, orange, silver. We still have trains stacked between Roslyn and Stadium Armory from a consistency reliability point of view that we're gonna have to deal with. This region is not gonna be stagnant for the next 100 years. We need to be thinking what we are more than what we are today. So some of the things I think it's really important to highlight on savings, as I mentioned, where we are in that operating sphere with our peers. Lots of work has been done in Metro long before I showed up here, and you'll see cumulative savings of eliminating positions, uh, hiring freezes back in the past, real estate, uh, ending leases, healthcare savings, a variety of things. Uh, this 50 million that you see in yellow represents last year we managed the place. We were able to save $95 million. That's a one-time savings. So we got to the team. We put a cost of uh, task force together. We came up with the ability to save 50 million more in reoccurring savings at Metro out of our administration and kind of uh, non-service delivery side of the, of the organization. For anyone that runs an organization, trying to take $50 million out of something without taking out of service I promise you, is a very hard and contentious exercise inside of an organization. Uh, but we feel confident uh, to do that, and we think it's the right thing to do for, our, for all of our funders around the region. A couple key uh, milestones here as I, I kind of get towards the end here, and I think this is really important. We, we are in a really crisis point here on timing. Timing of Metro's budget does not line up with other, other legislative calendars or other budget cycles around the region. It's always been that way. This year just makes it much more challenging. So you'll see in two weeks, I'm going to deliver what's called the general manager proposed budget. And it really is the official start of our budget process, the formal budget process. So I will deliver that at our uh, February, uh, sorry, February, December 14th uh, board meeting. I, I think it's been pretty clear. We've highlighted this for eight months. I think everyone should be eyes wide open of large fare increases, very, very, very detrimental service cuts layoffs, uh, the region that we know will not be the region of the future because the metro that we're going to talk about is going to be nothing like it is today. Just got to be, have to be honest about that. We don't have, from a fiduciary responsibility, I can't put a budget together with money that may happen. It's what money we actually have. Uh, we are going to be implementing uh, hiring freeze effectively in a few weeks. Uh, I'll talk about that in a quick second. Potential layoff notices to our staff starting in January. Obviously, very hard to keep morale and people's head in the game when they're getting layoff notices after we just rebuilt a boat out of COVID for the last year and a half. Uh, we, uh, we really need uh, to get through our, bu our board authorization public process because there's you know very community-based process around how we do it. There's Title VI analysis and things like that. The 3% cap, both in Virginia and Maryland, uh, basically, even if Virginia and Maryland had unlimited amount of money, uh, and I don't think that's the case, but let's say they did, 
they need to adjust their law to actually flow that revenue into Metro above the actual 3% cap. So I know that there's leaders in this room that are working on that and we very much appreciate it. Uh, we need to get a board adopted budget around April. That's when it's scheduled for, so we can apply for our annual federal grants. And then we can actually start having the, the team available to run service starting in July. So where it's really challenging is we, by compact, Metro Compact, have to have a balanced budget effective July 1st. We have no taxation authority. We have no revenue authority. So it's it's up to our partners to determine ultimately how, how large this organization is to deliver service. To avoid those service cuts, that cap, as I mentioned, has to be adjusted. Metro, at least the Metro GM, and I believe the board is saying, we're not trying to say there shouldn't be a cap. What we're saying is that cap needs to be adjusted to the new reality baseline that takes into account the credit and the COVID inflationary pressures. Uh, and it probably could be a one time to get back to a 3% or CPIW. Uh, we have to work through our CBA. Our largest CBA expires at the end of next June. That drives a significant cost around us, uh, but it also doesn't align well with this legislative calendar. With the layoffs and hiring freeze, I just wanna be, you know, again, eyes wide open and transparent. We are expecting once we start the hiring freeze with our normal attrition, we will start to see a degradation of service next winter into the spring. There's no getting around that. So even if all the money is solved and we're good for July 1st, the longer a hiring freeze and that uncertainty goes, just as we're probably hitting cherry blossom season, we are gonna stop running bus and train trips, which will impact the entire network and the reliability and kind of the overall customer experience is gonna go down. So I think when, that, when it's all said and done, I'd leave it, you know, since this is the state of Metro, which is this. The state of Metro, I think, is strong, but very uncertain. And we all have a region have to determine what do we want Metro to be? Are we gonna recover Metro and be that foundation for an, an amazing region that can rebuild and be something even bigger? Or are we gonna have Metro kind of atrophy and then try to dig out of this thing long-term and what it is for the overall economy? So I, I will remain optimistic and bullish. I know our partners are, are really working on this. I wanna again, thank all of our partners, especially our two secretaries and DDOT, uh, the mayor, legislative leaders in the room, governors. I know everyone is thinking about this. Uh, we are here to, to help in any way possible. And we just thank you for all your support. So thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. We doing questions? Or no? No, it's up to you. Okay, I'm told I'm gonna do up to a couple of questions if, if they're easy. Or not, or, or not. Randy, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Brian Jones, h and What um, conversations are you having with the White House and the federal government about the return to work? We saw the the just this morning in Axios, the chief of staff was talking about meeting with the secretaries at the cabinet level about pushing the agencies to get the workers back. We know that that's you know, a, a backbone of ridership for you. Uh, what's the communication like between Metro and the federal government? Yeah, I, uh, thanks, Brian, for the question. So we've had uh, several really good conversations with OMB and uh, OPM uh, about this. Uh, Regina Sullivan, who's next year is our head of government affairs, is kind of uh, at least on a biweekly call uh, with all of the, they have like a kind of an HR lead, like, for lack of better, for all the kind of secretariats. Uh, we're also providing data for all of them. And it's interesting that article this morning referenced the data that we we, gave, we we continue to give them. So I think our point of view is, listen, we need more people on the system. Uh, and I don't care whether what their purpose is, quite frankly, uh, but the federal government base is fantastic for us because not only is it uh, kind of uh, a true people that live here, they all pay from a federal government point of view, a subsidized fare, which then really drives some fair revenue for us as well. I mean, as an organization, I just believe to run a really good organization. You have to have people present. Uh, and I think that's really the message the president. So I think we got to be careful not to say the federal government needs to come back to support DC or Metro as much as the real thing should be to run a really good organization. You have to have some some physical presence, I think, as an organization. And then we get that secondary benefit uh, of that participation. Yeah. I'll take the lack of questions as everyone agrees we're going to come up with some good money during the holidays. So thanks again. Well, that's great, Randy. Thank you. And that uh, was a, a, an excellent overview of where we are. And, you know, we're, we pride ourselves on being a region of highly educated people. So I'm sure we can solve this problem, both in the short term and the long term. 
you know, and while Metro is critical, there's also a lot of other important components for a fully integrated mobility system that we're striving to build here. The one that drives our region's economic growth and creates opportunities for all of our residents. And over the years, we've worked on some of the most important infrastructure projects, including the Wilson Bridge, Intercounty Connector. I know today the American Legion Bridge comes up quite often uh, as, as a key priority, and I'm sure I have a chance to talk about that in a little bit. You know, it's interesting, we uh, project up to uh, one and a half million people uh, coming to our region, and we'll see how that plays out given, you know, the changing dynamics and working from home and remote work and other things. But if we have another million people added to our population here, like, how are they going to move around? We're already ranked as one of the most congested regions in the country. So, you know, in the, uh, what Dr. Cirillo said, uh, shared with us earlier, so where are all these people going to go? So we're really lucky to have the people here with us today that can answer that question for us. Uh, so uh, Secretary Miller, Secretary Wiedefeld, and uh, Director Kirschbaum, I want to thank you all for being here uh, today uh, to share with us. And so first, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this next conversation, Leslie Foster. Leslie, you want to come up, please? Leslie's an award-winning journalist and a mainstay of Washington News as a weeknight anchor for WUSA Channel 9. And uh, so we're looking forward to really great conversations. Thank you. That is a great greeting. Jack, thank you so much for that introduction. Kathy, thank you so much for also inviting me to be here. I'm excited to see all of you. I'm not usually up at this hour in the morning because I do the five, six, and 11, but y'all are special. So that's why we're all here. And I get to introduce and really lead an informative conversation here that will hopefully motivate all of you to think differently and to do different something differently when you leave here today. I always say when you're in a space, you wanna leave people better and more informed than you found them. So that is our goal today. And we do that by inviting our esteemed panelists to join us this morning. So first I'd like to welcome Sharon Kirschbaum, who is the Interim Director of Transportation for the District Department of Transportation to come up and join us here. Come on up. I'd also like to welcome Shep Miller, the Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth of Virginia. He had the longest commute. <laughs> and finally, we round out this dynamic panel with Paul Wiedefeld, Secretary of Transportation for the Maryland Department of Transportation. And of course, we're here to discuss with all of you this whole idea of moving from place to place. And, and in my business, the business of communication, I talk about the business of truth and humanity. And your business is about moving people from place to place, right? Um, but that is obviously a very layered thing, moving people from place to place. And we've heard terms today about vibrancy and economic growth and long-term stability. And when I hear those things, I always think about people people who have to provide for their families, children who may be moving around parts of our region for the first time to places they've never seen because they have the opportunity to move around through Metro or through transportation. Um, and so I want to help us frame our conversation with people and personhood at the center because when I hear a lot about what's happening with our region, when we hear about what General Manager Randy Clark just laid out about the future of WMATA. Um, I'm deeply concerned about people who live on the margins and who are underserved and how these challenges will impact them even more greatly. And so we can't have a conversation about emerging from this pandemic in an equitable way without talking about how transportation impacts not just those of us who have the most, but those who have the least. So shall we talk? We've got 30 minutes to do this so that we can make sure you know something, you feel something, and you act differently based on what you hear today. So why don't we start our conversation with each of you telling us a little bit about yourself, about your administration's vision for transportation, how you're working toward that vision as an agency, and maybe talk a little bit about progress or areas that maybe we're still falling short. And we'll start with you, Terrific. Interim Director Thanks, Kirschbaum. Thanks, Leslie. Hi, good morning, Sharon Kirschbaum. I am now in my, I guess, two months as in own director. I've been at DDOT as the deputy director for two years. So I think I'm probably the newbie. And I'll be honest, I'm also relatively new to the transportation industry. I am, uh, my background has been in local government and federal government, both in DC and other cities, um, and done stints in the private sector as well. 
I think my area of focus has been budget procurement, navigating the bureaucratic areas that make it hard to get things done um, in government. And I'll tell you, my last uh, role in local government here in DC was at the Department of Human Services. And while there, I think I really became sensitized to what it feels like to transact business with the government. Um, at DHS, we provide eligibility determination services for SNAP, TANF, and Medicaid. And while we feel like we're giving people help, um, that help doesn't always feel like help when it requires multiple stays, waiting in line, having to come back again, having to get the right documentation. So figuring out how to simplify things, what does that business process feel like, whether it's for a TANF recipient or for someone who's in line for a permit, um, that's really been a lot of my, my orientation to government and, and just keep it easier for people. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis our big vision. So we have the unambitious 25-year transportation plan that is founded on seven priorities. So <laughs> I'm gonna run through those because I think um, it is something that we need to continue to move across all components. Uh, that involves safety, safety is probably our North Star, equity, mobility, infrastructure project delivery, maintenance and operations, enjoyable spaces, and sustainability. And I wish I could say we can go all in on any one of those seven, but we really need to keep all seven in mind. Um, we have done an incredible job, I think, building the infrastructure so that we can have 25% of DC residents live without a car and they can get to where they need to work, where they need to um, live, shop, go to religious services, whatever they need. And that's possible. And that is very much because of the infrastructure we've built vis-a-vis -vis, um, bike lanes, priority bus lanes is our, our new focus right now, which I'll talk to later. Um, and we have sidewalks that are safe. We have enjoyable spaces. The thing that I am going to just own a little bit in the question of sort of where are we coming up short has, has got to be in the, the safety area. Safety um, for us means slowing things down. So I know we had a lot of conversations about congestion, which slows things down. But that is something that we embrace because slow drivers are not resulting in traffic fatalities. Uh, in terms of Vision Zero, we are at 45 uh, fatalities this year. That is record high over the past few years. And it is so frustrating. We invest so much in traffic safety interventions. We have an engineering toolkit to help make intersections safer. And we have been doing a really expansive job in that space. The other safety toolkit we have is automated traffic enforcement. We are introducing 470 cameras, whether it's speed cameras, red light cameras, um, stop sign cameras, to again, get people to slow down and to comply with traffic laws. And we have um, in, uh, in addition to enforcement um, education, and we are relaunching some education efforts to change behavior. But at the end of the day, we are seeing that these traffic fatalities are often being caused by reckless and distracted drivers, and we don't have a good toolkit for that. Um, we can tell this because a lot of the fatalities are involving the occupant in the vehicles, and that's really a sign of, of really um, driving at incredibly high speeds. So we're coming up short with that goal. We are far from zero, um, and we're really struggling with how to target those that subset of incredibly dangerous drivers where the perfectly engineered intersection and ample traffic enforcement is not going to stop them. Secretary Miller, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you had the longest commute of all of us here today, and and tell us just a bit a more about- Just a hop, skip, and a jump. Just a hop, skip, and a jump. Leslie, thank you. And let me thank the Board of Trade and the Washington Partnership, Jack and Kathy, and particularly Georgetown for letting us be here, David. I think he's gone on to get back to work, perhaps. What a great place. Is. What a beautiful facility and, you know, one of the premier institutions of higher learning in the, in the country and in the world, actually. Um, so it's just great to be here. I was in the Amazon uh, headquarters yesterday, the new Amazon headquarters, which is stunning. This place is equal. Uh, this is a great, this is a great facility here. So glad to be here. Um, Leslie, um, you know, unlike most of the folks involved in this in this work, I'm not a transportation professional. I'm not a government professional, if you will. I worked in government um, the first time in 1980 for three months when I was in the Senate of Virginia working as an aide. And I haven't worked in government since until two years ago. So I'm back. Um, I'm a business guy um, from Hampton Roads. 
um, have spent my whole life there. And I was a defense contractor, sold my business and, um, and retired, I thought. Um, but I've been on the transportation board for eight years on and off. And the governor asked me to come up. So that's why I'm here. Um, and excited to be here. It's a great time to be in transportation. It's a great time to serve the Commonwealth. And I got a fantastic boss. And so we're really excited to be here. In Virginia, um, my, my, my governor likes to say, Governor Youngkin likes to say, Virginia needs to be the best place to live, work, and raise a family. And that's really what it's all about. And transportation is a critical piece of that. As you know, um, our vision in Virginia is to have the very best transportation system in the world not just the safest, not just the most efficient, not just the co most cost effective, but all the above of that. And we're working really hard to do that. And, and um, thankfully, because of many people that came before me, um, we've been, we have the third largest highway system in the country and we're ranked the best highway system in the country by the Reason Foundation this year for cost effectiveness and performance. So that's not really my doing, as you know, you inherit these things and you sort of hold on and try to set your own piece for the next administration. But a lot of people worked hard to get there and we're certainly part of that. And transportation in Virginia, you know, transportation is, is diverse in Virginia. In my job, I'm the secretary. I don't run the department, that's an agency. Um, but I have everything from, from VDOT and um, to space. So we're launching missiles out of Wallops Island or rockets out of Wallops Island, I should say, to the space station. I was gonna, I thank you rockets, for being ever so clear about rockets, that. Rockets, because we might have to have a side conversation of, if there was of, something else going on. Rockets out of uh, Waltz on, which is on a huge growth curve, by the way. Very exciting. We've got DMV. Um, you know, DMV was sort of a mess in Virginia, frankly. Um, and through just pure management, uh, Randy, pure management, no money, no systems, no new stuff. We took the wait average wait times when you go to the DMV across the Commonwealth from 38 minutes pre-COVID to eight and nine minutes today. So people going in there are saving 25 minutes on average, millions and millions of people that visit the DMV. So it's just a huge savings. And we did that just by getting the employees to focus on what was important, helping them to understand this has all been employee driven from the bottom up grassroots. We pointed at stuff and said, how do we make this better? And we formed teams and it's just been fantastic. So we've got that. We're working hard on our smart scale um, process. Smart scale is our award-winning and, and innovative uh, process where we where we uh, uh, rank and, and and score transportation projects in Virginia to determine which ones bring us the most bang for the bucks. And we've been doing that for about uh, eight, ten years now. And we're and we're in the process of tweaking that a little bit to make it even better than it is. So we're excited about that. And then we just want to make sure that we maintain the assets that we have. And that's part of what the Reason Foundation talked about. And Sharon talked about safety, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the, in the, uh, a little bit later, but um, she's right. Safety is a huge problem. Um, Virginia much bigger, of course, in footprint. Um, we lost over a thousand people last year, a thousand, a thousand people. And I, I say this all the time, imagine if we had three airplanes crash in Virginia every year with 333 people on it. Every year, year in, year out, they crashed, everybody died. What would we do? It would be very different than what we do here. And the problem here is we've gotten used to it. And it's one here and two there and one here and three there. And you just read it every day in the newspaper. And, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I see them all. You know, I get texts every day. Yesterday, we had somebody killed walking across the train track. Young boy. Terrible. Terrible. So we're really focused on that, and we've convened a group in the, in the state government between um, transportation, um, public safety, um, to, to really focus on this. And how do we get that down? And, and frankly, um, to Sharon's point, we're not going to engineer this out. It's, engineering is not the problem. It's a part of the problem. It's a small part of the problem, frankly. It's driver behavior, right? And the only way to engineer that out is educate and enforce, right? You just can't keep somebody, you can't engineer somebody from walking across the street in night and dark drunk. I don't know how to fix that, right? I, I can't fix that in an engineering way, not, not in a practical way. So we, we've got to do better. And, and, and my, my goal is to bend that curve. 
And as I said, you know, we got a thousand. Thankfully, we're down this year so far, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed. We're down a little bit. But if we could bend that curve 15%, everybody who was in here now wouldn't be dead. And otherwise, you would be. Think about that. Think about the impact of that. If we can do that as transportation leaders, and I could save 150 people every year in Virginia, or 300 or 400, year after year after year, imagine the impact. And so that's what we want. That's what we're about. Secretary Wiedefeld, you've spent time both in Maryland and in DC and in Virginia, and you are not a stranger to most people here in the room <laughs> or me, <laughs> but tell us a bit more about your priorities now. Where sure. you are. Uh, if I could, let me just start off uh, picking up where uh, the secretary just ended. Mm -hmm. I often get asked, you know, what keeps you up at night? And the only thing that keeps me up at night is just those issues. Someone dying on our system either one of my employees, one of our contractors, or one of our users, uh, whether it's a, on a facility or one of our services. It's what kept me up at Metro. Um, it was what drove a lot of the decisions there, was how do we not have that happen under our watch? And it's something, you know, that uh, you and I, like you say, every day I'm getting dinged on, you know, an incident somewhere across the state. And it, it's what eats at us all, I think, in this profession, uh, that we can't do more about it. And it's the challenge that we face to try to get there. So just um, hate to start off on that, but it, it is such yeah. a serious issue for us. And unfortunately, we're headed the wrong way. We had uh, almost 550 fatalities last year, of which almost a third were the most vulnerable users, pedestrian, bicyclists. And then this year, we're aiming towards almost 600 fatalities. So those are souls. Those are, you know, those are family members, yeah. right? Um, so we have to do everything that we can to... to to continue to focus on that. In terms of uh, overall arching vision uh, for the department and really for the state of Maryland, if you've heard our governor speak, um, it is, you know, our North Star is leave no one behind. And what that means for a department like ours, and so we, we run, you know, transit, the airport, the port, highways, and DMV, and we've also hit, hit very little numbers, thank you. Um, <laughs> and, and the toll authority. Come on. <laughs> that's right. Let's compete. Um, that's right. That's good. Um, so anyway, so, you know, we, we run all this. But when we, when we think about it now, you know, historically, a DOT thinks of moving people or goods from A to B. Right? That's where we spend a lot of our energy, a lot of our thinking. And yes, we do that, but that is not what our vision is. Our vision is how do we bring people that have not had the, uh, been part of the success of our state and what role can transportation play in doing that? Mm -hmm. And not only what role does transportation play, but how do we interact with other parts of state government to make that happen? So whether it's working with the Department of Labor to create a workforce uh, you know, uh, initiatives, whether it's working with the Department of Corrections to basically get people that are coming out of that system and giving them the opportunity to get back into the economy, whether it's working with our um, Department of Environment to make sure what we do does not obviously take us backwards. But most importantly, how do we support social equity, right? Sustainability of our communities and protect the environment. And the way that we're approaching this is we have to think of how do we, particularly on the, on, the, uh, on the surface transportation side, how do we get people either out of their cars or get more people in their cars, right? And to think of them that. So everything that we look at now, whether it's in how we plan, how we design, how we build, and how we operate our system, comes with that lens. And, uh, and, and to be frank, that's, you know, I've been in this business almost 40 years. I've been in, in different modes. But uh, and I did not know the secretary. I mean, I did not know the governor um, until I met him <laughs> during an interview. And that's what brought me uh, into this, to be frank, because that is the vision of the governor. And it's something that uh, he's passionate about. It's something that, that, that obviously feeds a passion in me. Uh, so that's where, that is where we're going to take the state. Uh, very tough, tough choices have to be made to achieve that. Um, but I'll go back to the core issue, which is, uh, you know, will always be, the safety of, of the individuals that use our system in any way. You talked about tough choices. Obviously, we heard WMATA General Manager Randy Clark lay out for all of us, and he has done this for some time, what has been called the death spiral of Metro, right? And we know how essential Metro is to 
all of the region and to all of the priorities and to families and to companies and to businesses. But if I could be his transportation translator here, I think what he's saying to all of you is, show me the money. <laughs> How are we going to keep this integral system that impacts everyone in this region um, how are we going to ensure the health of it? How are we going to ensure the safety of it? And how are we going to ensure the funding of it? And each of your jurisdictions has skin in the game. So Secretary Wiedefeld, I, I, I said to you, do you have muscle memory from this? Because you've been down this road. You've had to make the case that the general manager has made about the challenging times during your many years of service. Why don't you start us out by talking about what Maryland is going to do to help WMATA regain its footing? First and foremost, um, you know, the importance of that system to uh, obviously to Maryland, but to the region is really, um, it cannot be overstated because it is what basically makes us competitive both nationally and, and internationally, right? Uh, in everything we do. Um, so we, we cannot let it obviously fail. Um, but we also have to deal with financial realities, right? Um, so I have also a system in Baltimore that's under the exact same stress um, that we have to, you know, meet commitments there. We run, you know, six modes, and they're under under stress, as, as was mentioned earlier. We have a multi billion dollar hole in our capital program, so we have to put that in context with the other pressures we're under. Um, does not mean we're not going to obviously meet what it takes to con continue to to support the system, build the system for the future, improve the system. But like any household budget, you have to do it within a budget. And so we'll have to make some hard decisions. I know that, that the agency is, um, and we'll do that. Um, one thing I did want to mention, though, with, with my experience at, at Metro, and, and we lose sight of this sometimes because we get hung up with the numbers and, and all the different things, is the workforce, the frontline workforce, and the tremendous job they do. And I, I don't think it's fair to to move that it's you know it's their part of the problem, and I, I hear that you know occasionally, and I don't think that's right. Uh, having worked uh, worked there, these are men and women that that are very committed you know to their to their customers and, and to the agency. So I don't think we're going to solve it by just saying okay we deal with that issue we solve it. Uh, having sat through not, lots of negotiations, um, I think there we'll all have to come to the table for sure to deal with this issue. But I don't think there's a silver bullet out there. Um, I think it's going to be a continued discussion. Uh, we'll have to make some hard choices along the way. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think any of us are going to back away from the importance of that system to, to uh, this region. Secretary Miller? Leslie, um, I agree with the secretary when he starts off to say, well, MOD is incredibly important. Metro is incredibly important to the Northern Virginia and, and, and obviously to the region and to the Commonwealth. Um, so we'll start with that. We understand how important it is. The second thing I'll say is, um, you know, we're excited about what Randy's doing. It's hard work. Paul knows Paul knows the challenges there, but um, we have a lot of confidence in Randy, and we think he's making some good decisions and and leading his group in the right way. So I'll start with that. Having said that, you know, Wamada's got some intractable structural long-term problems. Jack sort of mentioned some of that earlier. Um, you know, the pandemic um, made it much, much worse. But over the last 10 years, pre-pandemic, the ridership's been going down, down, down. It's down 17% from 2010, right? We're expanding the system. We're increasing service and less people are riding for 10 years, for nine years. So what's all that about, right? What's going on there? So we got that situation. And obviously, at the same time, if you look at fares, fares have remained relatively flat over that period of time. So people are paying less, there's less people paying, there's more service, and what do we end up with? You know what we end up with. We end up with a big hole, right? So that's where we are, and at the end of the day, you got a supply and a demand problem. We have some more supply today than we have demand. And, you know, I'm a business guy, right? I can't go to a government and say, give me money. I could only go to my customer. That's the only place I could go or somebody to loan me some money, right? That's the only place I have to go. I have to meet, I have to meet the need at the end of the day to pay the bill. And, and WMATA is no different, right? 
The, the government is not a blank check. Our citizens don't, they're under stress as well, right? They're suffering the same inflation pressures that everybody else is, is suffering. And so it's tough stuff. And the question that we have, or that I have, the administration has, is how can we get WMATA to really be the best it can be? How do we right size this thing? How do we get it so that it does what it needs to do, but we don't spend more money than we need to to get there? And frankly, I think we are right now. That's what we're doing. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's not an easy situation. Paul knows it. Randy knows it. But our admin and facilities costs are really high at Lamar. I mean, they just are. And compared to the other systems, and they're high. And there's some vagaries in the data and so forth. But you lump it all together, you just look at it. And our costs are high at Lamar. They just are. And our service, you know, we've got a service level this year that's the highest we've ever had. Highest service level we ever had. And yet our ridership is way down. So you can't keep chasing that. It costs too much money to chase it. And the question is, how often does a service need to be to be viable to bring people to the system? How often does that have to be? I got on at the uh, at the station, the new station um, out in Crystal West, uh, uh, Capital Landing, uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And um, a beautiful place. It's really going to be great for that region, uh, for that area. And I looked at the fare to Boston. It was the end, the last uh, stop on that line. And it was about five bucks, right? And it was running really fairly regularly, every few minutes, six, seven, eight minutes, whatever it was. It was pretty regular. It was good. And I just took up my phone and called Uber. What does it cost me to get the Uber or Uber to go to Boston? And it was like $28 in tolls, right? And how many minutes it was. And so that was the option I had, right? And I should have called Lyft. That's what I should have done. Um, so I did. <clears throat> but in any case, the point is, those were my options, sort of, right? And like, it should have been $7 instead of 5 Should it run, you know, 30% less? I don't know the specific answer. But I can tell you that you can't just keep chasing that. The other thing I would tell you is that the fares are flat. There still is tremendous fare evasions. And listen, I, I just don't know why we accept that. And now, obviously, Lamont is fighting back on that. <clears throat> but go pull the data. It's, it's, on the, it's on the website. Go pull the data and look at the fare evasion by, by station. You've got stations at 50 60% fare evasion. 15 60% of the people who get on don't pay. Right? That's a problem. If 50 60% of my customers in business didn't pay, I'd be out of business. Right now, Randy showed us the slides. We know that fares aren't everything and that there's subsidies in here, but everybody's got to do their part. So I'm looking for WMATA to come forward to us and see it and show us some real, some real hard choices. And some of that is going to be, some of that's going to be people, some of that's going to be service, some of that's going to be fares, um, but it's got to all work together. And at the end of the day, you don't want to kill the system. You don't want to put it in that death spiral. Nobody wants that. What Randy showed us is, is true and it's important. And so I, I think we just got to get serious and we just can't afford what we can't afford, but we still got to deliver what we need to do to do the, to do the thing. Well, I, I would say, WMATA would certainly say they are doing their part around fair evasion. There's been a lot of, <clears throat> of um, procedures put into places and certain stations where there have been problems with fare evasion, which have also been controversial too, right? Some people say, well, wait, why should we do all of this stuff? Um, it may be harsh. Uh, obviously, there are other people who say, wait, we can't lose all this money. So it it seems to be a straddled line that everybody is having to walk here on that. And, and certainly Randy Clark can talk more about that. And if there are questions about that, maybe we can get to that at the end. Leslie, let, me, let me just say this. So you brought it up. I just can't go there. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't grasp the concept that fair evasion is OK. I just can't I grasp that. Mm -hmm. That's coming into my store, picking up a piece of, uh, picking up a loaf of bread and walking out the door without paying for it. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know why that's okay. I just not. Um, if you need bread, I get it. But like, I, I need, I need it too. And so it's just, you know, I mean, I'm, and I'm not talking a little bit. I'm talking fifty and sixty percent in these stations. Unfortunately, and you know, this is not, this is not a bash or Walmart thing, but facts are facts. 
the last board meeting, we looked at the buses, right? 28 and a half million bus trips in last quarter. 8 million were paid. 8 million out of 28 were paid. 20 million riders didn't pay. They fare or the or the or the system didn't work. What do you do with that? Well, you got to fix that problem. So, listen, nobody wants WMATA to succeed more than the people sitting up here. Nobody understands. Everybody understands how important it is. But we've got to, and it's not a for-profit business, as Randy said. Nobody's looking for a profit here. We're just trying to balance the books, and we got to balance supply and demand. We got to do that. We have to find a way to do that. Hey, director, sure. Um, just to add and acknowledge, yes. Uh, so Wamada's survival is a district survival. We're we're all in, and um, we know that there's some incredibly hard choices ahead for everyone. And we appreciate that Randy's leadership is here to help shepherd through this really challenging time. Um, I do want to uh, add something to the supply and demand concern. And, and one of the things that we are, as the district is really trying to help support is to drive <clears throat> demand, because that is a lever that we, we have. Uh, so priority bus lanes has been key to that. If people are sitting in a car and they see the bus zipping past them, that actually now becomes a viable commuting option for them. If they see the bus is stopping and delayed, then suddenly that's that's not gonna be a choice to get out of the car. Um, we built 12 miles of priority bus lane. We're halfway to our goal. By 2025, we wanna have 25 either built or, or constructed. And those are game changers. It's not just the red paint. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, queue jumps. It's having, uh, you know, the buses don't need to pull over because we've got um, bulb outs for loading and unloading. And now with our clear lane traffic enforcement, we can improve efficiency of buses by 15 to 20%. So that makes it an option that people may not have had before. We, or have considered before, and even, helping bridge that last mile. If people are getting off the Metro and think it's still a 15 block walk, but we have scooters and bike share readily available with bike infrastructure that makes them feel safe doing it, then suddenly the Metro becomes an option. So, so we need to go all in to help improve that demand so that people are getting out of their cars. Because again, we are nowhere near where we were pre-COVID and we need to, as Randy showed, we need to go back, not only to where we were before, but really drive ridership even well beyond that. So. I'm gonna move us through these next questions individually for all of you so that we can get them answered. And hopefully if you all have questions, we'll get to that. So forgive me if I'm moving this a little more rapid fire. Secretary Wiedefeld, mm -hmm. let's talk about what's happening with the, the Moore Miller administration. Back in August, the department mm -hmm. announced a new path forward to address congestion mobility issues on 495, on I-270, the American Legion Bridge. Can you talk a little bit more about this vision and where that currently stands? Sure. Uh, you know, the governor's committed, obviously, to, to try to take on some of these issues head on, um, but in a different approach. Uh, that, as you know, that project had a history, uh, but it was moving in a certain direction. That changed, the business model changed with, with the uh, partner that we had in that. So, you know, our goal is to, to basically work with the community and develop something in that corridor that basically meets the community needs. It's going to be much more multimodal focus in terms of, of getting at the issue of how to make transit move quicker across the bridge. We have a bridge that needs to be replaced. We, we all know that. Um, how, do we, how do we introduce uh, uh, trans-oriented or, uh, trans development along that corridor, for instance? How do we use the Brunswick line along that corridor? How do we get people, again, to maybe share rides in that corridor? Mm -hmm. So that's what we want to do is work with community. We've held a number of meetings. We have one in Rockville, I believe, this Saturday. We'll do another series uh, right after the, after the new year. Again, to work with the community and say, what is it that you need, <laughs> right? The southern portion is a little clearer because of the bridge and its element. The northern portion, north of the ICC, uh, you know, I-270, which is its own separate issue. Uh, in some ways it's connected, but yet it's its own separate issue. Total rethinking of that, and again, with the community. So that's where we are. It's just sort of starting that process in some ways new again, but at, at a much more community-based approach towards it versus us coming in and saying, no, here's the answer, and we're ready to go. Secretary Miller, we talked about Virginia. You've adopted this public-private partnership model, try to solve some of the big issues around congestion throughout the Commonwealth. I wonder what's made this model successful for Virginia, and, and are there some other sort of unique opportunities 
uh, that you're using or considering for transportation and, and your infrastructure needs? Um, great question, Leslie. And you know, most of these most of this work came way before I got here. Although I've been on the board and watching it, um, Virginia's a leader in P3s, as you know, and we've had some great ones, and we've had some that aren't so great. I think the the one thing that that's, that tops the list is you really got to know what you're trying to get here. You know, we we're about choice in Virginia, so our P3s are not about you know uh, generally are not about. Um, you either use it or you or you or you don't go. Um, we have that down in the Hampton Roads region in, in one particular area, and it's and it's a difficult situation. We didn't have a lot of competition, so competition is extremely important in P3s, right? So you got to get a handle on your costs. You got to have good competition. You got to know what you're really trying to do, and you got to have some choice there. And we've had some steps that we do that weren't great um, early on, but um, in general, we've done a great job, and uh, we continue to look at more opportunities. At the end of the day, you're going in business with a private partner, right? And they're gonna they're gonna run it, and they're gonna try to do it efficiently. And so you got to make sure your deal's right. You know, you, you got to make sure the public gets what the public gets. The great thing about P3s and choice, though, and, I, and I'm a little bit late to the game on this. I I'm, I'm not a huge fan of tolls, frankly. Um, and and we could have a long session on that, and and, uh, and we could go through all that, but we won't do that here today. But at the end of the day, when the private sector offers an alternative, offers a choice. And you don't have to do it if you don't want to. If you take it, the people that don't do it are, are helped. And you're helped. And you decide to do it. It's, a, it's you know, it's, it's just like, do you want a nicer dinner or do you want a lesser dinner? And people have a choice and it makes a huge difference. And so we've been successful in Virginia doing that. We'll continue to look at opportunities to do that. We're looking at them right now um for additional opportunities there and um we'll continue to chase that until it makes not doesn't make sense to do so but um it's really been good for virginia and um we'll continue to make sure it is director kirschbaum we know dc has several major long-term projects programs in the works so how are you thinking about these projects and programs as part of the larger regional transportation system and how is that going to be key for helping with this vision for better mobility across the region? Sure. I think I, I need to manage expectations a little bit in terms of the <laughs> scope of our infrastructure projects. I know when the bill money came out, people had big ideas and they were really excited and those numbers seemed big. Um, and an earlier speaker talked about the fact that our construction costs have been going up so dramatically that much of those new dollars are actually helping us pay for those projects that are already in the queue. Um, and our first and foremost priority has got to be really the, the sort of restoring our bridges. We have three bridges that are in poor condition. So that's got to be at the head of the queue. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, H Street Bridge by Union Station um, and our Benning Road Bridge. So those are really quickly coming out um, and, and we're starting solicitations this year on those um, 395 HOV bridge lane. These are not exciting, fun, new things. These are, are getting um, the bridges in the condition they need to be, but we've got to, with limited resources, focus on, on sort of the fundamentals. Um, and we have some really fun things too. Uh, we're still working on a deck over and DuPont Circle to make it really an open space uh, that can be used for, for public enjoyment and not just for, for commuting and traffic. Um, and then our, our 11th Street Bridge project, which is something very close to my heart, we've used the abandoned piers when we redid the 11th Street Bridge, and we're going to have a park that's going to connect Anacostia mm -hmm. to the Navy Yard. Uh, it's going to be state-of-the-art and iconic, and that's also moving quickly. So we have really exciting projects, but our list is not growing. We're really now using the resources that we have, which are incredibly constrained, to get done the fundamentals and where we can sprinkle in some of the fun stuff. This is, this is really interesting stuff to hear, all these projects that are coming together, because as you move across D.C., Virginia, and Maryland, and you see all of these things happening, you wonder, okay, when is this going to be done, and what's next, and what's happening? Um, and you talked about bridges, which are also so very important to the District of Columbia. When we had those issues where pedestrian bridges have been hit and things have come down, that has literally cut people off from other parts of the city. So when people ask about bridges and why they're so important, they are building bridges for people to go places to get to these important services and things that they need. And it's important to remind people of that. 
To close us out, I wonder if each of you could share one key policy pro, uh, policy or priority, I should say, whether it's transportation related or transportation adjacent, um, whether it's about land use or funding that is going to be essential, you all think, to realizing what your administration's visions are for not just your jurisdiction, but for the entire region. And would you like to start us off? Secretary uh, Actually, I, I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, I I have to go back to the safety issue. Yeah. Mm. I, I You're mean, still my Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it is it, I, like I like I talked about before. So some things we're doing there, looking at our, our complete streets program, for instance, hasn't looked at in, in over a decade. And what can we do to make sure that we're keeping people safe? Yes, there's going to be the incidents of the person in the middle of the night and doing whatever they're doing, but there's many other incidents where it's it's things that maybe we can do differently or incorporate the ability to even walk at the beginning of some of these projects where we provide the facilities. You saw the graphic earlier that the, that the professor showed that yes, you can do this, um, but it's an investment, it's choices, you know, as, as the secretary's mentioned before. So that really, that is something that I think it's, it's this region, it's, you know, I have 24 counties, that that is an important issue across the state of Maryland, everywhere I go. That is really the number one issue I, I, I generally always hear about. It's it's really interesting that all of you are centering on this because I know as a journalist, I I it seems to us that we are covering far more of these tragedies. I, mean, I think last week in Riverdale Park with the two young children crossing the street with a father just trying to get to school and they are hit and killed and you can't even imagine what their families are grappling with now. So to hear all of you say that this is on your radar in a different way tells us that there is something that we have to do behaviorally as well, 100%. right? Whether we're walking or whether we're biking or whether we're behind the wheel, we all have to be part of the solution here. Um, Secretary let, me, let, me, let me double down on that, Leslie, because it's, it's just... Um, you know, as we've pushed and pushed and pushed um, to get bike pad in, right? We've done more of that, and it's for good reason, good stuff, right? Um, I don't know how many of you all have done have had this experience, but I got hit by a car on a bike, broadside, T-boned, and I flew. It's the only time I've ever flown, uh, <laughs> for real. And it was great till I came down, and then it didn't wasn't so great. Um, so I know what it's like now. Thankfully, I wasn't seriously injured. I was beat up a little bit and I hurt for a long time, but but um, nothing beyond that. The point is, is we introduce more bike pad. You know, if you hit a car at 20 miles an hour, two cars hit, generally people don't die. You hit a bicyclist at 20 miles an hour, a pedestrian with a car, not a good outcome. And we, as we put more people in there, you talked about Amsterdam earlier. Somebody talked about Amsterdam. I love that city, by the way. Um, but as you put more people and you don't do it the right way, you're just creating the problem, right? And I'll give you an example. So I live in Richmond during the week and um, I'm on a, uh, my commute to work is a one lane, or excuse me, a one way road. And I get to a stoplight where I need to make a left onto another one lane, one way road. And I can do that in Virginia, right? I signal and I wait. Well, right to my left, when I'm doing that, is a double bike lane. And it's both ways. Can I make a left? Anybody know if I can make a left? I don't even know if I can make a left. Right? I literally don't. And I've tried to look, right? And here's my point. <clears throat> I'm 66 years old. I got my driver's license and my driver's training when I was 15 and a half. No one has given me any training since then. No one has told me what laws have changed. No one has updated me at all. So we give you your license and say, have a nice life. You know, if you get to be 80 or 90, maybe we'll try to test your proficiency once more, but otherwise you're good to go. And we change all this stuff and we don't teach anybody. And then we're not enforcing either by the way. So what do you expect? The other day, and, I, and I'll be quiet, I was involved in a, in a ribbon cutting for a safety project. It was on the railroad. It was a great project, if you will, and I'm glad we did it. But what it did, you know, when you come to a railroad crossing, particularly in a, in a rural area, and you got 
you got the bar across you. And then on the other, going the other direction, on the other side of the train tracks, you got a bar like that and the lights flash and, and, the, and the bells ring and you stop. Guess what we did? We put up another bar over here and another bar over there. So you couldn't drive around the bars. Come on. And we'll spend millions of dollars doing that because somebody decides to drive around the bars. What, what do you do with that? I mean, where does it end? Right? I want to educate and enforce and stop spending money to save people from themselves on engineering and hard cost stuff. We got to, we've got to educate and enforce. And the education is the key because people don't know the rules. They don't. And we don't do anything to tell them. And I don't think it's any different in DC or Maryland or anywhere else in the country. And we've got to start doing that somehow or another. Interim Director Kirschbaum, I'll let you have the final words, Leslie. I don't think I need to underscore more on the safety piece. I do want to say one thing that we're looking at that runs a little counter to the theme of great uh, complete streets is really now looking at complete networks. That we can't make every street be all things to all people, and we just really kind here, of get bogged down on the weight of it. Here, here. So early on, we wanted to expand the bike network, and we were every opportunity we had. It's a road die, put in a bike lane, and um, and we did have a fantastic proliferation of our bike network. But what we need to do is do fewer and make them better. Yep. Because um, I think our first speaker was showing the range of how comfort people, comfortable people feel with bike lanes, and just throwing up paint and flex post does not make it safe. No, it does not. Um, so going all in when we're doing a bike lane with concrete and, and making them hard and safe. And that means that we're not gonna do one on every street. And we're gonna go all in on bus lanes and make some streets where we are going to have rapid, efficient buses. And then we're gonna have others where people are going to be able to drive um, and use those really for, for commuters in. So um, that's just one piece of kind of think how we've been evolving our, our thinking. Well, I wanna thank all three of you for being here today to have some really frank conversation about the transportation opportunities and challenges ahead. So Interim Director Kirschbaum, Secretary Miller, Secretary Wiedefeld, thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. And I will turn this back over to Jack McDougall. Well, thanks for everybody for coming today. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for participating. I thought it was a very frank and candid conversation. Uh, this is Terry Rainey. Thank you for uh, starting the conversation. There we are. Thank you. And uh, happy holidays. And everyone up there. Yeah, be safe. Yes. <laughs>